do a little bit more political analysis, a little bit less discussion of how the buildings fell and so on and so forth. So again, it's an honor to, uh, to be able to share the podium with Tony and Michael. And I have tried, I, I've complied about 50%, uh, Paul, with your request. So about the first half of my talk will be an attempt to do some context, to, to say a few words about the importance of this event in Canada. And then in the second half, I will, I will get back to the event itself and I will show you some of the slides and I will give you some examples of some of the things that I find fishy because I don't want to take it for granted that you all know that. I'm going to begin by telling you a story so you can put your heads down on your desks and close your eyes. This is the story of Bin Laden and the Magic Lamp. Once upon a time, in a country far, far away called Afghanistan, a man named Bin Laden was out walking in the mountains. He was trying to figure out how he and his band of men could mount a successful attack on the homeland of the strongest nation on earth. He was depressed. It seemed impossible. As he stepped into a cave to get out of the sun, he saw an old lamp lying on the ground, and he picked it up thinking, maybe it's a magic lamp like in the old stories. He rubbed the lamp, and with a brilliant flash of light, a huge genie burst from the lamp and hovered in the sky above Bin Laden. The genie said, greetings, master. It is my honor to offer you three wishes. Bin Laden knew he had to think fast. This is a rare opportunity. O oh, genie, he said, I wish to carry out a great act of jihad against the most powerful of nations, but my followers in North America are not up to the task. Frankly, they're losers, given to alcohol, cocaine, and lap dancers, and they are unskilled at flying the planes they must pilot on the great day. Genie, my first wish is that these idiots become great warriors virginal, committed, suddenly and magically skilled in the art of flying large planes, yet so elusive that they will never show up on any passenger list. And the genie said, done, master. And then bin Laden said, oh, genie, I'm troubled by the reluctance of jet fuel to burn as hot as I would wish. I'm frustrated by the reluctance of steel to melt. And I am furious about the way buildings refuse to turn to dust when I snap my fingers. Genie, to put the matter simply, the laws of physics put all my plans at risk. So my second wish is this. On the great day, may the laws of physics be suspended. And the genie said, done, master. Oh, genie, said bin Laden, my third wish is the most difficult to fulfill, yet it is crucial to my plans. After the great day, may all the nations of the West fear me and my band as if we were a great nation with a fearsome army, navy, and air force. May these frightened nations throw themselves into wars in faraway places, leaving hundreds of thousands of victims. And may, then, may they then turn on their own populations, assaulting the very rights and freedoms they brought about. Oh, genie, by all the power you possess, I ask that you fulfill this my, this my final wish. And the genie said, done, master. Well, I've given some thought to this question of whether the official narrative of 9-11 is a fairy tale, like the one I just read you, which I frankly admit I made up. And in one sense, it seems to me it is, which is to say it requires us to suspend our critical faculties and to believe in magic and to believe that 9-11 was a special day on which magic occurred. But of course, fairy tales usually announce themselves pretty explicitly as fairy tales. As soon as we hear, once upon a time, we know what's up. We know that what we're about to get isn't a description of a historical event, and so we don't get confused on that score. And in that sense, fairy tales are generally not too dangerous, because there's a certain honesty there. The official narrative of 9-11 is different in this sense, and so it's not entirely clear that it's a fairy tale. It doesn't announce itself as a fairy tale. It's presented soberly as true and factual. What is it then? 
Is it a scientific hypothesis? A reconstruction of historical events? Apparently not, because we are not supposed to examine it or put it to the test. When we try to do these things, we are told we are incompetent or insane or morally deficient. I've been called all three. I believe we can best understand the peculiar nature of the official narrative of 9-11 by thinking of it as a myth. I'm not using the term myth here to mean a lie or even a deceptive narrative. I'm using it the way we normally use it in religious studies, to mean a sacred story. Typically such sacred stories as found in religion and especially as found in national cults, sacred story of the nation, are considered above ordinary investigation and criticism. They're not to be treated as ordinary explanations, descriptions, or hypotheses, which should be investigated, but as holy, that is H-O-L-Y, holy narratives, to be taken on faith. An example, in March 2005, Popular Mechanics editor James Mig, after expressing outrage at those who dissent from the official narrative, said, quote, we as a society accept the basic premise that a group of Islamist terrorists hijacked four airplanes and turned them into weapons against us. What a strange statement. We as a society. Who's he talking about? Presumably U.S. society, but it appears that we in Canada are expected by our governments to subscribe to this too. But why on earth would any society accept a series of historical allegations as a, quote, basic premise? That is to say, not, it's something that you don't question. Surely Mig's statement must be read as a statement of faith. Surely the story of 9-11 is here regarded as a foundational myth, that is to say, a sacred story underpinning a social order. And in this case, a social order certain people are trying to help give birth to. Since 9-11, factions within each Western nation have encouraged their populations to, inc in, to incorporate the myth of 9-11 into existing bodies of national myth. Now, since each nation has its distinctive body of national myths, its distinctive language, core concepts, and so on, the myth of 9-11 will be woven in somewhat different ways into the self-understanding of different peoples. In the United States, for example, freedom is a core concept in the national myth. So we won't be surprised when we hear Mr. Bush say of 9-11 that freedom was under attack. He'll also say, and I'm quoting, freedom and fear are at war. That's 9-11. Or again, the terrorists hate our freedoms. Although there has been in Canada a faction in high places that accepted this Bush interpretation in this American language, we remember Rick Hillier saying, quote, they detest our freedoms. Gee, I wonder where he got that phrase. In the end, the language adopted officially by our Canadian government has been different because the government has realized that the major majority of Canadians would not accept the Bush interpretation or that particular language or that particular national myth. However, even the Canadianized version of the story of 9-11 has had very serious results for us. The myth of 9-11 is now supposed to be part of Canadians' new self-understanding, that is a self-understanding that has emerged since 9-11, and of our actions abroad, very concretely. We can see this in the 2005 International Policy Statement created under the liberal Paul Martin government. We can see it in the ramped up military budgets since 9-11. We can see it concretely in the Canadian entry into the Afghan war. In their book on Canada's war in Afghanistan, Stein and Lang say, and I quote, Canada is fighting in Afghanistan because an Afghan government supported those who planned and executed an attack against the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. That the Taliban mistreated women and violated their basic rights was not material to the decision. End quote. Stein and Lang are certainly right that 9-11 
or I should say more precisely, a particular understanding of 9-11, which Stein and Lang apparently accept, is responsible for the Canadian shift in policy toward Afghanistan. In other words, it was 